Hi, I'm Iris Muller. I'm a certified rehabilitation counselor and a proud mom of two children, one of whom has quadriplegic cerebral palsy and is nonverbal. And I'm Alma Schneider, a licensed clinical social worker and the proud mom of four children, one of whom has Prader-Willi syndrome. In this podcast, we discuss the uncensored truth about raising kids with disabilities. Prepare to laugh, cry, and hopefully learn something new. This is Two Moms No Fluff. Hello, everyone. I'm Alma Schneider, and I'm here with Iris Miller, and you are here with us at Two Moms No Fluff, where we talk about all things parenting kids with disabilities. Hello, Iris. Hello, Alma, my friend. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm, Is your microphone okay? <laughs> my microphone's okay. I'm just adjusting it. You know, we try to do all of these in one take, as you know, because we're two very busy moms and we who, who's got time to edit when we're, you know perfect is the enemy of the good, as we always say. Um, <laughs> so but, uh, yes, we're excited to be here today. We're, uh, would you like to tell everyone about our topic for today? Definitely. Talking about topics is my favorite. So <laughs> today we're going to discuss something very important, which is activism and how we from just standard people became such like fierce activists in the name of disability rights and our kids and the world in general just wanting to make it a better place for everyone and I think that uh, the best I think saying is what's personal is political because mm-hmm. everything that we do as parents especially as parents of children with disabilities is very very important and has an effect on the rest of their lives and the rest of the I guess community and how it sees and reacts to our children so Alma my friend I'll pass the mic to you and uh, because if there is an expert in activism, it's the lady right next to me. And I'll let oh. her start with her amazing stories of activism. You flatter me, Iris. Always. You flatter me. You deserve um, all compliments. And it's, you know, as I always say, right back at you. You're a <laughs> wonderful activist. Um, there, I, I, first of all, I want to commend everyone who's listening because sometimes you know, if you read a title of the of the episode, you might say, eh, I don't want to listen to that one, even though all of our episodes we feel you can and uh, it will resonate for you and you can, might be able to learn something from. But this might be one of them where you said, oh, I don't want to listen to this, or you might feel bad that you feel like you're not an activist and or you, it might be too overwhelming for you to think about doing activism when you're already so overwhelmed with everything else in your life. So first off, I want to thank you for even listening in. And I want to say, say from the very start, activism can be so many different things, things that you never even considered to be activism. And as Iris just mentioned, and she'll um, you know, have more to say about this, the you know, what's personal is political. So even just going out into the public leaving your house with your child is a form of activism. You are out in the world. You are showing people that your family might be different. Just that simple exposure is a form of activism. So let me just start right there. If you feel like you're not an activist, you are an activist just by being you and being your family and being out in the world. So let me start off with that. In addition to that, um, there are some, I'm going to start off with some tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny ways that you can be an activist. Um, activism simply means that you're, you're, you're um, raising people's awareness about a topic, an issue, um, at, you know, anything from, as I mentioned, leaving the house to, you know, starting a rally for, for a cause, but even promoting other people's activism is a form of activism, a very important part of activism because we don't just need leaders, we need soldiers in the, in the, in the world of activism as well. So that means posting, um, even posting memes on Facebook is a form of activism. Wearing a t-shirt, talking about, um, you know, with a child in a, using a wheelchair is a form of activism. Um, so in your, you know, your attire, if you're having a conversation with someone and they use a word that is an ableist term, um, like, uh, 
uh, what's an example? Uh, give me an example, Iris, of an ableist term. Uh, <laughs> that caught me off guard here. Alma. I know. I'm just thinking like, like, uh, well, uh, an obvious one is the R word. That if anybody in a conversation used the R word, you could correct them and you know, very politely say that's, you know, that, that word is, is, is offensive to a lot of people. I'm sure you didn't intend it in that way, but that's how it sounds. That is a form of activism. Um, there's so many small, small little things that you can do. Read books to your children about uh, able, you know, that are not ableist and that expose uh, children to other types of children who may have a disability. Reading books in your child's classroom uh, that are about children who are different, who have disabilities. That's another form of activism. So I'm just going to start off with those very simple, simple, simple ones that, that you can do. Um, and then I'm going to pass the mic back on to you, Iris. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, the most important thing is that really the things that kind of press a button for us as parents, they affect probably hundreds if not thousands of other people out there and when we react and make a small change that is concerning our personal life we are creating this ripple effect and i i want to give an example of a, a mother that I, I know that had like a a bus pick her child to school and the title on the bus that was providing services to the the child offended her and I don't remember what was the term or what was the the reason it offended her but she made sure that they you know repainted the bus and used a more more politically correct term for for that bus ride and it's something small but that bus obviously would not just pick her child to a school or other activities it would drive through town and everybody mm -hmm. would see that title that was offensive so this is a way that something that is you know very personal can affect the message that other people in the community see and this is this is so important because it's kind of like a maybe a small problem that has a huge effect I remember the very big commotion around like a name of a sandwich in Montclair and I'll let you talk a little bit about that but these are small things the, the terminology the names that we use the titles that we give that can really have a huge huge effect on people um, Alma before I'll, I'll pass it on to you to tell maybe the sandwich story I just <laughs> want to mention that that really all of those things that you you already referred to like going out I think that every time that we we do have the time when we are out and about to really interact with the bypassers to answer questions about the wheelchair about the service dog about our children mm -hmm. these are educational opportunities if if and when, because I, I swear we're not always in that mode that we can stop and really share and explain and educate. But on the good days that we are like um, that, we are there and, and actually doing that. I know that every person that encounters us and, and had this opportunity to chat had to, in a way, reevaluate their uh, preconceived notions about disabilities and about families with children with disabilities. And I think that uh, this is something that you can't maybe give a title to. This is not activism, but yes, it is. And yes. I want all the parents and families out there to know that this is a small way that you can change a little bit, change one, uh, one person at a time. And it's so, so important. And I'll give more example later on, but back to the sandwich. Yeah, excellent, excellent points. Anything we do for our kids, as you mentioned, is laying the groundwork for the next person. So for example, in our town, um, having a child with, with uh, my son's, the features of his syndrome really had an effect on his uh, classwork at, you know, how the class was run, how the school was run in many ways. And there are other people in town now who have the same syndrome and they don't have to go to all that trouble, um, all the things that I had to go through because now, even though this is a rare syndrome, there's, you know, other pe there are other people in my town now who, ha who have kids with it and they um, don't have to do as much work, hopefully, as, as we did because we already did it for them. And so we might be doing things that we think are for ourselves, 
but we're really, it's like any movement. Um, we are, whatever we're doing is laying the groundwork for the next generation. So keep, always keep that in mind. Um, so the sandwich, yes, you remind me that in our town, there was a deli um, that had a sandwich called the Angry Dwarf. And um, many parents were put off by this, even though their children did not have dwarfism, they were very put off by it. The, the disability community was very put off by the, that name because there's a stereotype about, you know, people who have, I, I, I'm sorry that I'm not remembering the official name of the syndrome, but it's referred to as dwarfism sometimes. And um, it's people who have this, you know, talk about the, uh, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, how one of them was angry and dwarfs or people who have dwarfism are often portrayed as, you know, fairy tale figures. And it's very, as you can imagine, that's, that's really um, uh, offensive to people who, who have dwarfism and who have children with it. So many, many people signed a petition to um, change that name of the, uh, the sandwich. And apparently the deli did change the name of the sandwich. So just by putting your name on something, so signing a petition is another form of activism. Um, a lot of people, um, one of the deterrents to activism for a lot of people or what they believe to be activism is, um, it, a deterrent is that they're outing their child by being activists. And it's, you know, I don't take that lightly. I, I really want to respect people's, um, where people are in the journey. You know, we'll be talking about it at a later time, but I was very private about um, our son's disability for a very long time because I didn't want him to be, I have, a, I have many reasons why I was private about it, but suffice it to say at this moment when I'm discussing this, that I simply didn't want people to know and, um, or the, the exact disability that he had. So getting involved with things, you're outing yourself, but there are many ways, and I wanna respect people's journey, that it takes time. If you have a child who has an invisible disability, you know, obviously if you have a child who's using a wheelchair, you can't hide the disability or at least part of the disability, but um, there are ways to, um, be an activist and not have to tell the world about your child. You can donate money to causes that have to do with your child's disability. You can assist, um, you can be a volunteer in your gym, helping out another person who has a disability, um, which is what a lot of people in our town do, which is really nice at the YMCA. They assist uh, people with disabilities so that they can work out. Um, there are so many ways, so many organizations where one can volunteer to, to, to help someone, again, without outing yourself, you know, um, or your child, if you're not at that place yet where you feel comfortable doing it. Volunteering for organizations, donating money to different organizations, going on marches for different organizations, being an ally to um, other, or it's important that we, we really are activists for not just our children's disability, but for anybody who's in need. Um, of, of support. So going on marches, uh, donating to other types of causes, not just, not just your own. Um, those are just a few off the top of my head. Some, some more so, involved ones. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, so I, I wanted to add to that, that uh, one of the things that uh, kind of happens, I guess, with the evolution of uh, I guess, a life with a disability is that people do tend to research, uh, you know, the condition and what it entails online. And then you'll find yourself probably being connected to some organizations. If you subscribe to their email, it's very probable that at one point or another, you would start getting emails, for example, uh, from the Spinal Cord Injury Association, uh, please support, uh, I guess, increased uh, rates for uh, wheelchair purchases through Medicaid. I don't know what it, what it might be. I'm just giving a random example. <laughs> but uh, uh, then many of those organizations, they already send to you a ready-made email that you can send your uh, representative in mm -hmm. government. Uh, and just all you need to do is sign and add your email address. These are very, very simple things to do. And mm. soon enough, you'll find causes that are really very close to heart. And I, I really uh, encourage people to really 
participate in everything that is disability related because once you are in this community, you understand that things that might not affect you directly might, might affect your friends with a similar condition or a similar uh, disability. And, and it's just such a worthy cost because, cause, sorry, because as we know, um, it just disability is really the last minority. There is so many things that uh, as a group we are lacking in terms of resources and uh, attention and understanding. So it's really important to support causes that are close to heart and also things that are kind of second and third degree remote to what, what it is that you're fighting for for your specific uh, child or family. And yes. then uh, I, I wanted also to mention that uh, writing letters it doesn't matter where you are in the game if you're mm -hmm. totally kind of uh, uh, shy about your child's condition and it's mm -hmm. not something you discuss with friends and relatives you can still write to your uh, local representative and government representatives and uh, you can even uh, use a format that you found online or you can write something on your own but uh, we, we got responses many, many times. And now what we also do is we send a letter that we wrote and ask all of our uh, daughter's aides and caregivers to send a similar letter. So our voice is kind of echoed by 10, 14 other people sending the same, uh, the same letter. So I, I encourage, letter writing is a good form of communication. Uh, we sent emails, we sent one page uh, snail mail, and we even sent uh, back to that uh, huge petition about the playground packages with so many letters in them uh, so people cannot ignore it when they get something mm -hmm. this this thick, they, they have to somehow reply and respond. And uh, just uh, whatever is easy for you, Mm -hmm. At the beginning, start with that. And uh, and it's almost like, I think for us, at least, it was like a snowball. You become active on one arena and then on another. And uh, right now I'm at a stage in my life that I'm physically kind of looking for those opportunities. So I'm in a new uh, town and uh, I registered myself to a citizen course uh, because I want to be exposed to all the different entities in this mm -hmm. town and for them to be exposed to me and my radical ideas is about accessibility <laughs> and equal opportunity and and this is this is how i do it i just i i want to carve this place in which i can voice my opinion yeah yeah and i love that you you mentioned email because um you know with email it used to be a letter writing thing that you had to do before email you know i'm dating myself but um you you know you don't have to even have a stamp you don't have to have an envelope you're just cutting and pasting an email and sending it to your local representatives and i also want to mention the board of education of your town so many times um i, I can't tell you how many times i've heard members of the board of education say things like well we didn't know this was an issue because nobody ever you know talks about it when they come to board of education meetings and here we say that's because they have kids with disabilities at home and they can't make your seven o'clock meetings where the public comment is at nine o'clock so they because of some activism public comment was pushed to the beginning of meetings so people you know didn't have to wait till 9 10 11 o'clock at night to speak but they also can email in so that's something that we've done um in our disability community in Montclair that we um, we share information about what's needed and then people can uh, have their voices you know heard by sending an email we try to make it as easy as possible by sending the emails of the people who are important right in the content of the email that they can you know cut and paste the information but they also have the emails right there so to make it as user friendly as possible because everybody's busy and if you have a child with a disability, you might be extra busy. So having everything really readily available to, to do the activism is extremely helpful um, and efficient. I also want to mention that um, uh, starting a support group. So I've, uh, you know, we've mentioned in previous episodes that I, I started a support group 11 years ago, simply because I wanted to continue the community that we had created in our um, in our preschool where the kids were. So our group is now close to 300 families and it's all online. 
And then in addition to being online, it's like a listserv chat group online of parents. And in addition to that, we do meet once a week for it's a drop in group. Right now during Zoom, during um, the you know pandemic, we've been meeting uh, virtually in a Zoom. But if you if you search in your area um, for for um, support groups and you can't find in the start your own, promote it on Facebook, promote, go to different uh, organizations that have people with children with the same you know features that your child might have with their disability and just start it and promote it through Facebook, through whatever social media, tell all your friends to tell their friends, start your own group. And it's just, it's very informal. And then slowly but surely people will start sharing their resources. So it's a form of support for each other, emotional support, but it's also a way to learn about different resources in your community. And there is always more power in numbers. So if you get a, if it's just two people, that's great. But if you can, you know, ramp it up to get more and more people then when there are causes that are near and dear to your heart as iris was mentioning you can you can galvanize each other and send out you know emails or make phone calls to pe- you know people in power to change accessibility in your town to to change the curriculum in the schools to to not have the kind of autism awareness days that that you are tired of seeing with a puzzle piece maybe and you want it to be something different um, creating community is so important. And we've, we've talked about that before, but there's always more power in numbers. And again, putting my social worker hat on, if we're feeling more comfortable and more supported, we're going to have the mental and, you know, emotional bandwidth to take action, um, and, you know, make the world a better place for our kids if we're taken care of. Yes. And, and again, the, uh, the thing where the personal becomes political it's just really like going in town and not telling businesses i can't access your business because i have like a wheelchair and there's a step here it's one strategy but the po- problem remains both for you and for other people coming to that same business afterwards it mm-hmm. just in a way I, I can't not tell businesses anymore when I see like an, a, a problem with accessibility. It's almost like a must. It, and I think that at the end of the day, I'm doing them a favor because I'm sure. opening, opening up an opportunity for them to get more clients that mm-hmm. they couldn't like enjoy before. And, it, and it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal for many businesses. For example, the, the issue of a service dog, you'll be like shocked at how much misconception and misunderstandings there are about service dogs. And uh, while, uh, you know, in, in the ER, nobody asks any question and they zoom us, is, zoom us in with the service dog and there is no problem when we sometimes stop at the I don't know, a simple store. They're like, we can't have a dog here. There's germs. <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah. It's really bizarre. But um, education is, is the way to go. You really have to explain and to um, uh, give examples in which they understand that the dog can do something that a person can never help with. For example, sniff a seizure before the seizure actually happens. So mm-hmm. I, it, it's just uh, education is very important. I think personally, our, our family had the privilege of being able to travel internationally, just joining our you know, my husband on business trips and going to places like India where the effect of like seeing our child with a wheelchair was like so profound that even on my Facebook page, there's this picture of Karen being surrounded with a classroom (laughs) filled with children that had lots of questions. So we made sure that someone could could translate from English. I think it was to Hindu. I can't remember which language these kids were talking, but to to take the time and explain, especially when there's an opportunity with such a big audience, because Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, they all ended up taking pictures with her and all that. But I think this is a message for life that... uh, disability doesn't stop you from traveling disability Mm -hmm. doesn't stop you from enjoying things and uh, that a person can really do uh, live a full life with a disability which Mm -hmm. is sometimes shocking to people but which it shouldn't be but being out there and uh, modeling your parenting style and modeling your behavior and the fact that you expect 
and do participate in events that weren't specifically made for people with disability. That's like right. activism by itself. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You're reminding me about um, uh, the YMCA and um, there were all sorts of classes for teenagers um, and for, for middle schoolers to, to go to. And I thought, okay, well, he can never, my son could never do that because he needs to be supervised. Um, so what I did was I went, and this goes for, you know, not just YMCAs or community centers, but museums and, and all other types of places where kids are left alone that, that you know, when they don't have an aid, you know, they, they're, they're old enough where they don't require to have a, a parent or a guardian to be there. I couldn't do that. I, I had to have my son supervised. So I simply spoke to the director of the program, explained the situation that, um, you know, if there was going to be food there, it needed to be monitored. And, you know, I was concerned about in different kinds of interactions that might occur with my son there. And they created a whole program around it that made their program look really stellar. They brought in volunteers who were other middle school students or high school students who were kind of interning, I guess. And they, they paired up the kids who required a little bit more support and they paired them up uh, like a body system. And so that the kids with the disabilities were able to participate sort of seamlessly. Nobody knew that, you know, they were any different from anybody else if they, if they cared, you know, which mine would care if, if other people saw him with someone who looked like an aide, um, he would be self-conscious, but they created a whole program and that allowed again for our kids to participate in a program that other kids were, were participating in. So it provided some socialization and it provided other kids the opportunity to be a buddy to someone who was different. So they got to experience, you know, our kids in a setting that typically they wouldn't have been able to, to be involved with. And it's just, it's a win-win, all these things. And again, this is activism because if one person is asking for a change for their child, it is going to have an impact and allow other kids to benefit from that, from that uh, implementation of, of, of an, you know, yes. accommodate, accommodation. Um, I think I, that's we, uh, Alma, that for the, the one thing that is hardest about activism for, mm -hmm. for families of kids with disabilities is that obviously the person who's most affected by the, I guess, injustice in society is the child mm -hmm. in, in so many different ways. But they're too young to understand the magnitude or the effect of the discrimination and, yeah. and, and are un, unable to like do the activism for themselves. Yeah. And the parents are just most of the time so overwhelmed because of lack of services mm -hmm. by their own kind of life circumstances and by the, the, the magnitude of caregiving that they have to you know, be responsible for mm -hmm. that they can't really find the time to like march to the capital and do like right. uh, like really big, uh, strong effect, uh, I guess, uh, activism that uh, we see in protests and other uh, in other fields and areas. And this is why like the the small little things that accumulate is almost like the only route that uh, many families can can take. Mm -hmm. But but we need to do that and uh, yes. we need to I, I think also on in times that the injustice is real like to mm -hmm. use um disability rights organizations and and really go to court uh, with things and mm -hmm. this is somewhere that you can make a change for yourself but also make a change in legislation sometimes even yes. depending on the verdict on on that specific case and even if there isn't like I want to give an example like once we had uh, uh, we had to sue the state of New Jersey kind of because we didn't uh, get the wheelchair that our daughter needed and mm -hmm. they ended up kind of uh, making like six o'clock in the evening before the actual uh, you know trial they called us to, with a compromise that they'll pay but they close it not in court so there isn't like maybe a verdict and that opens the door to a thousand other people coming to mm -hmm. request that same wheelchair 
Yeah. But if something like that happens, still you need and you can call the wheelchair manufacturer, the other organizations that you're a part of and tell them, listen, this is what happened. We got payment for this and that wheelchair. And then other people can hear secondhand about it. And yes. there is also kind of a presence for something like that. So I, uh, I kind of, we're talking activism and I am thinking about myself our family like a few years ago I was just all that I was interested in was sleep and I want to I want to tell the parents that are listening that the little bit that you can do please do even if it's almost minute uh, and you, you feel that it's insignificant it is significant it does yes. accumulate and we we need to do something Every little something is better than nothing. That's my yes. and, message. And talking to, just simply even talking to your friends about it is so important about your life. Even that is a form of activism because they will, will, can then repeat the stories to other people and it kind of information spreads about what life with disability is like. And that might spark someone to take action, which brings me to another point allies. If you're listening to this podcast um, and you do not yourself have a child with a disability, thank you for listening in to learn what you can do. But it's really important that um, we talk to our family members about participating. I remember there was a, a, a couple a, a grandparents of a child who had Prader-Willi syndrome and their child, their grandchild lived in California, but the grandparents lived in New Jersey. The grandparents did all this activism for Prader-Willi syndrome in New Jersey um, including doing fundraisers, like they did a golf fundraiser every year to raise money for Prater Willie Syndrome Research, and and um, they also would would attend Prater Willie clinics at our nearby hospital, providing lunch. They would donate lunch to for families while they were in between appointments that were healthy and safe for the kids. So even family members can provide you know, can do something, even if they live far away, they can do their own form of activism for you. It's like a gift. Some of my family members donate money to the, you know, prater Willie Syndrome Foundation. These are all sorts of things that family members and friends and allies can do for us as well, as well as stand up at board of education meetings, talking about the need for, um, you know, uh, continuing to to put money into the special needs services in the schools, making sure that the classes are inclusive. These are these are it is very powerful to have someone who does not have a child with a disability saying, "We need to protect the rights of all children and to make sure that our kids are socialized together." So we want inclusion for that reason because we want to expose our children to kids who are different so that they can grow up. Um, understanding disability and knowing how to treat people, all people the same way. So there are so many different ways to be an activist at ways that you might not have even thought about. Um, but again, you want to make sure that you're comfortable and there are all different ways that you can be an activist while maintaining whatever it is that you need to maintain for your emotional health. It's, it's doable. And we're here to help you. So please, you know, I, you know, we've covered a lot here. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more to cover in future episodes. Is there anything else that you want to add, Iris, before we close As off? Today? Always, I just I invite our listeners to share what they have done in the past, what is important for them, where Amma and I can get more involved if needed, and uh, really just. Uh, strengthening the sense of community that we are as they say about the pandemic but this one too we are all in this together and we need to kind of push this uh, forward in so many ways yeah thank you all right well thank you for listening everyone have a wonderful week and we'll talk to you next time Bye -bye. Bye. for more information please go to www.twomomsnofluff.com thank you if you like this podcast, please subscribe and give it a five-star rating so more people can hear it. Thank you.